But you're going to get some very interesting DMs after this, by the way. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. This cop says we're pivot. You understand just how we living. This for me is like rap religion. Open on beat because we got this Skype. When it comes to this, y'all, I can get it hype. When it comes to this, y'all, calm has risen. How you living, huh? Yo, how you living, pivot? Years ago, while we were still shooting Entourage, I saw a guy that looked like you at Earth Cafe on Melrose, and he looked just enough like you that I was staring at him, and he was a guy from TMZ. And so the fact that I was staring at him, he decided, oh, this gives me permission to approach Rex and ask him whatever I want. And then I, what I ended up saying to him was kind of controversial and... TMZ called Doug the next morning and asked for comment on what I said. And HBO and Doug were like, surely Rex didn't know what he was talking about and you misunderstood what he said. And there's no way Rex said what you think he said. So like I was forced to get up in the morning. Like people were calling me frantically at five in the morning saying, you need to call Doug Allen at 6 a.m. and tell him what you really said. And I was like, is this for real? And what, it was all because I thought the guy was you. What did you really, what did you say to him? <laughs> What I said, and it's the truth, I said that I had been on the set of Entourage and I had experienced um, sort of standing there and hearing a crew member say something homophobic. And, um, and they were like, oh my God, this openly gay actor heard a crew member say something homophobic and how is this allowed to happen? And Doug said all the right things to me. He said, if this ever happens again, tell me and I will fire that person. And I'm like, well, that's nice of you to say. Um, but again, wouldn't have happened if I hadn't seen this guy that looked like, enough like you that I was like, is that Jeremy Piven right that, there? That is, that is, I mean, I, obviously they say there are no accidents, you know? It's just so, you know, it's interesting. And so I lost my phone in Israel and people said to me, oh my God, man, you must be fucking freaking out. And I said, do you know that them finding my phone and releasing everything that I have in my phone will be the best thing that ever happened to me? Because contrary to popular belief, and you you know this, whatever your fantasy due to this character that I played um, and some misconception of me, my phone is so boring. I don't have a dick pic. Mm. I'm just being honest. I'm just being, I'm not that guy. Mm. I don't send dick pics. Um, there, there are, you know, go through my emails, go through my pictures. I go finding my phone in Israel and releasing all that stuff would be the best thing mm. that ever happened to me. Because, and it just made me think of when you said, you know, someone saying something homophobic because I asked you all the wrong questions last oh, time. Oh, really? Yeah. Because for, so. well, for instance, it, it, and this this came up as you know we were both online looking and um uh Kyle posted this thing about like you know we'll never stop screaming Lloyd oh, right, at right, Jeremy right. and you're like no I get that <laughs> and the reality is you do I mean I can't even imagine the things that you've heard well yeah but I mean well okay yeah I was about to like start talking about something other than what you were talking get about. Get James Cameron on the phone or I'll <laughs> choke you out with a fucking strap on Lloyd. Well, no, mostly I get Lloyd. I, I don't get that as much as you think because the fans are lovely, but in the moment they can't think of that. So they just say Lloyd. So you just get Lloyd yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Now, be honest. Has there ever been a time where you just were like, you know what? My name isn't Lloyd. And, and oh no and, you know what no and i'll tell you why when we were shooting on trash half the crew called me lloyd <laughs> so i mean so i mean in the moment i was like oh uh, this oh is like this is God. the point at which i have to figure out how i react to this and ultimately i thought it was more flattering than insulting that they didn't know my name and they really just sort of you know associated me with the character i i personally love it when any crew or anyone in that setting calls me the name of the character. Yeah, no, me too. Because it just, no matter what, if you're if you start to wander or whatever, it just kind of lo locks you in. I love that. Yeah. It's like, oh yeah, you want to do the work for me? <laughs> yeah, that's right. But, um, Ari, you fucking douchebag. <laughs> now you're a fucking douche, bro. Come here, take a pic, bro. Yeah. Take a fucking pic, bro. The fuck? I'm a douchebag because of you, bro. <laughs> um. 
That's adorable. <laughs> and I'm at the urinal. And so oh, I don't, that, I don't stand at urinals anymore. I go into stalls. Oh, my God. <laughs> because you just don't want to have that conversation. Yeah. Early on while we were shooting Entourage, I was in a museum in San Francisco. And it wasn't just that someone said Lloyd to me at the urinal. They wanted to have a conversation. And I was like, I cannot talk to you while I'm urinating. Like, I need to concentrate <laughs> on the excretion fuck. of my waste. Right. Do not talk to me. Right. And after that, if I go into a into a restroom and a stall is free, I go to the stall. I've had dudes just looking at me to see what I'm working with. Straight men. Well, that's the other thing. I'm not I'm not into that either. Yeah, I can imagine, but it's either way it's awkward. Oh yeah, for sure. Because also if you're staring at my tiny flaccid penis where I look like an 8-year-old boy coming out of the cold water, I mean there's no one is this too much information for you? No. I, no. I <laughs> was But the, by the way, the look that Rex just gave you, wouldn't it be funny if I just called you Lloyd? <laughs> <laughs> the look that fucking Lloyd just... <laughs> is the look that he gave me after every Ari rant. I, I mean, I could never, ever, ever break him. Ever. <laughs> I mean, it was just no matter what I said. And there's some great fucking rants and you just stayed in the fucking pocket. Uh-huh. Um, I never told you this, but when I was preparing to play the role, um, I was working, you know, I was working with this acting teacher and I'll never forget it. Um, we were just going back and forth with it. And for me, if nothing else, just cause we don't get rehearsal really when you're yeah, doing not a lot No, So you got to hit the ground running. So I don't know if I ever told you this story. So we're working. And so he played you and he just said, let's just improvise. And, you know, he didn't really know my background or whatever. And I've been improvising since I was a, a kid on stage in Chicago, whatever. So, you know, that's part of my background. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh, this is gonna be fucking amazing. And I really had a sense of the character. And so he he was playing Lloyd and I, I launched into Ari so furiously in, in an improv and just yeah. fully committed. And it was too much for him. Oh, wow. And he got emotional. Oh. Yeah. Because I, I was like, I, I don't know. You, 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 you know, let's, I would rather, how do I put this? I'd rather go too far, you know, and just fully commit because it's just like a safe place. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Then, then kind of dance around it. But um, he was better than you, which is awkward right now. Better he, than me he, about what? Just playing the role. Hey, no, fuck just, you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was a really crazy moment because it was kind of like, listen, Ari and Lloyd had this incredible relationship where you, his tough love ultimately worked. But, yeah. um, and we're living in times right now. Do you think that, uh, with with the culture that we're in that um the show and to be authentic to the show the way we really spoke yeah. to each other could could work you're, you're asking a a tough hypothetical question yeah i don't know i get my impulse is to say no but yeah because of how sensitive everyone is i think so yeah do you and by the way we don't have to and this is not i'm just we're just going here. Do you think that people, um, do you think we're headed in the right direction? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the tough question. Uh, I'm hopeful that we're headed in the right direction. Yeah. yeah. I don't know for sure yet. Do you feel like you ever get a pronoun wrong? I, I haven't really. You know, it's, it's funny. I'm, I actually interact with a lot of people who take that very seriously and yeah. say, you know, if you if you care about pronouns, tell us. Right. And we'll care as well. Right. So I'm surrounded by those people. And then it's hilarious because in this whole group of people I'm talking about, all the people you think are he hims or he hims, and all the people you think are she hers or she hers. Right. So like I haven't even come across the person that they're being sensitive about, the they thems. Like I haven't met them yet. I just feel like, you know, 
it's funny, like when people pay money to go to a amusement park and they pay U.S. currency to have someone scare the shit out of them. It's like mm-hmm. life is already scary enough. Why would you even go there? And I feel like there are a lot of, you know, there are racist people and there are people with hate. And if you by accident misjudge someone, that's not coming from a place of disrespect. It just it just happens. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's it, we're we're living in fascinating times. Um, I feel like, you know, it's interesting because um, people ask me all the time. Here's the weird duality, I, and I'm not just saying this. Every time I go out, people ask me about a reboot, hmm. and yet here you are, and here we are saying, I just I think if we were authentic to the the show and the characters and the relationships, it might be too much. But too much for who exactly? Because all I know is that. People want to see it. It's almost like comfort food for them. They want to see these characters again. They want to see maybe how they would navigate this landscape, which could be really fun. Yeah. But I mean, it's interesting because we had these billboards. And if you had a billboard now where you had five white guys walking slowly towards you, people would be like, is that a documentary for January 6th? What is that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's, it's you know, strange, strange, strange times. But... At the same time, the industry is a business. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, there's so much content out there and very few things are breaking through. And I think if you have these loyal fans that want to see these characters again, because the reality is, how would this current climate treat someone like Ari? Mm-hmm. He would have to learn how to navigate that. And that, to me, would be really funny. No, I would find that interesting as well. This was uh, an authentic show about the backstage life of Hollywood that we were yeah. trying to portray. And this is a work of fiction. Yeah. We're, we're here to play. These characters exist. You know, but there was still a part of me. I guess it's, it's my way of saying, like, it's interesting. You can never judge your characters. No one is the devil in their own story. Right. That's just a reality. Yeah, yeah. So I know who Ari Gold is. Um, he exists. There's, mm-hmm. a, there's a real Ari Gold out there. And so you have to enter into that without judgment and embrace that character and see it all through their eyes. And yet in the morning, it's Jeremy and I'm going, Rex, holy shit, have you had so much cum squirted in your eyes that you can't see what's right in front of your fucking face? There better be a scud missile heading towards us, Yoko, or I'll choke you up with a fucking strap on. Are you okay with this? <laughs> you know what I mean? And, <laughs> and you're like, yeah, just fucking say it, yeah. dummy. Um, but me as Jeremy, I'm going, I just want to make sure we're, we're all good. And then they yell action, and we launch into it, and we we crush it. Um, yeah. It's really hard to get that much cum in your eye. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Season two, coming at ya. Don't go anywhere. How You Live in j Pivot will be right back after we pay some bills. When you think of champagne, you automatically think of that classic tall flute to pour it in, right? But what you didn't know is the flute is not the best way to drink champagne. Now, most world-class sommeliers actually prefer the tulip glass. It's very close to the common white wine glass because it allows the bubbles to fully develop and release the aromas. It's mind blowing, right? Well, I bet you never heard of Blida, which is basically an oversized shot glass used by the traditional winemakers of the Champagne region. Who knew? I didn't know. Well, just as you probably never considered a wine glass or Blida for Champagne, I bet you've also never heard of EPC Champagne. Now, EPC Champagne, this is the young French brand that is dusting off the aging image of Champagne and promoting ethics and sustainability over profits and quality over quantity. Finally, EPC is the fastest growing brand in Paris and is winning taste tests all over every competition across the globe. EPC not only offers innovative and contemporary drinking experience, It offers champagnes with complete transparency of production, something that is very rare 
with any champagne brand. EPC also understands the importance of health and responsible drinking, which is why all of their wines have low sugar content. It's lower than any of the other brands. And by the way, I just want to add that the lower the sugar, the lower the hangover. They're not claiming that, but I know that personally because I do a great deal of drinking. And I, anyway, I digress. They even have an award-winning sugar-free Blanc de Blanc. That's amazing. And don't miss out on their brand new rosé from Province. A rose bottle is absolutely beautiful and makes the perfect gift for any event. EPC will be available in the U.S. for the first time ever this year. But for the U.S. Pre-launch, EPC offers to discover its wines before anyone else. Just follow EPC Champagne on Instagram and you could win their full range of champagnes and their brand new rosé. Just follow EPC Champagne and you could be the proud owner of these prestigious wines before anyone else. How cool is that? You can't lose. All you guys have to do, follow EPC Champagne on Instagram to enter. Let's get after it. Do you guys want to do some... Uh, audience questions? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, we're going to listen to these people. Like, yeah. We're going to hear their voices. Right. Amazing. Lloyd! Oh. <laughs> this is a question to Jeremy and Rex. Um, what were y'all's favorite moments shooting together? Good question. Huh. And it's so funny that he led with Lloyd. <laughs> By the way, when I'm doing stand up, you have no idea how many times people scream that out. It's just. It sounds like everyone has Tourette's, like at the same time. <laughs> it, it's hard to, you know, I, can I go first? Yeah. See how I have to defer to him? It's like, <laughs> it's it, it's interesting. We, we are not our characters. <laughs> Ari would never defer. Be like, I got this. You shut the fuck up, Lloyd. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, uh I, the, all, all the moments with you were, were great because you always were locked in. You never wavered. I couldn't break you, um, which for my ego was a problem because I always thought, God, I can break him and I never could break you. <laughs> but for the character and for the show, it was perfect. But I remember saying to you something in your first season where I wanted you to stay and you're like, I'll stay if you promise never to mm -hmm, say mm -hmm anything derogatory or any homophobic slurs. And my character <laughs> said, I can't promise that, but I'll do the best I can. And it was just, it was just so uh, honest for a, a character like that, you know, cause usually they would just lie and go, yeah, whatever you want. Of course, I, I, you know, I got you. I mean, you know, I'm here for you. I'm not for, of course I'll never say that. But for, for that character to be totally honest with you in that moment, and then you for Lloyd to to recognize that honesty yeah. and say, okay, I'm in. That was kind of a that was that was a cool moment. I think that was maybe my favorite moment. But again, could you have that scene today? <laughs> that's a, that's a very sweet scene. You can yeah. have that scene for sure. I, yeah, that's what yeah. I'm saying. That's what I'm saying, man. What's so crazy is we have to realize at a certain point that our boss is our audience. You know what I mean? Yeah. We we make it for them. So like, what are we doing? You know, we're getting in the way. It's like, you know, the, uh, this character was an equal opportunity offender and he would have to learn how to navigate this culture. And that to me would be really funny and oh, fascinating. I agree. I, I think that would be really interesting. I really do. And entertaining. Why not? I think he would he would blow it immediately. <laughs> you know what I mean? And and then he would have to go into training. Lloyd would have to train him. Oh, that would be cool. You know, it would have to be some sort of sensitivity training and yeah. he would have to take it seriously. It'd be fucking hysterical. <laughs> uh sorry, what what do you have a favorite moment? I or? do. I have so many. I mean, I'll just piggyback on what you're saying. I mean, shooting that entire episode was great for me because if you really look at that season, I always I always I make this joke, which is like in in episode five or six of that season, there's an episode where I have one line. You're walking out of your office, you're blowing by me, and I say, "John Cryer's on line six. and that's my line for the whole episode. Right. So when they like hand me a script, and I'm like, 
oh, I'm in this, you know? Like that was awesome. And I was like, okay, this this is when I can't fuck it up. They're right. they're trusting me. Yes, yeah. they're, they're saying, come play and prove yourself. Yeah. If I drop the ball, it's over. Because that's, you know, that's the second to last episode of the season. I, you know, started season two thinking Emily's first line in season one is, hi, I'm Emily, Ari's new assistant. Oh. My first line in season two is, hi, I'm Lloyd, Ari's new assistant. I think, is that their running joke? Am I getting fired at the end of season two? And next, you know, next year there's, hi, yeah. I'm Christopher, I'm Ari's new assistant. Right. I'm like, I don't want to be a part of that joke. Yeah. I want to, they got to come. They got to keep me, man. Yeah. So that was like, I was like, I, I just have to rise to the occasion and defy them not to keep me around. So and, you, that, and you did. And you did. And by the way, they would never have done that if you hadn't earned it. If they, because that's what was cool about the show was, and it's a tribute to Doug, because he would see what relationships are working. And then go, okay, we got to explore and heighten this. Yeah. And it was very, very clear. So, I mean, any young actors that are out there, it's like, it's such a cliche, but there really aren't any, you know, no matter what, if you're on camera, you're in the game. Mm. You got one line, you don't have any lines. If you can listen well and be totally present, you can steal a scene. I shouldn't say this and Doug's going to kill me for it, but I'll never forget that we were, we were doing the scene and, um, I didn't have any lines and I remember asking him like I ended up it was it was uh Gary Cole and who was an agent that kind of was very eccentric and we were going to um to visit Aaron Sorkin in prison it was just a fucking brilliant episode and I you know I love that scene and I said how did it go and he goes it's not working scene's not working and I went I, I, it was incredible what why and he goes you stole the scene I said, I did? He goes, yeah. And I don't, know, I don't know why or how. I don't know if it was acting. I don't know what it was. And I went, oh, okay. I do. You know, and, and you have to be very diplomatic, but I'm thinking, well, what did you think it was? <laughs> did you think it was wardrobe? Did you think it was a lighting? It was a, a magical, what, you know, and that's my point is they call, it, this will sound so pretentious, but they call it playing well without the ball. And you had to do it a lot. And the reality is like, you're in character and you're listening and you're engaged and it doesn't matter how many lines you have. Now, ironically, they would hand me four page speeches and because I could do them, they just kept coming. And ironically, I play better without the ball. Mm. Um, I'm in the middle of shooting something right now that my sister's directing that I've been putting together for 10 years. That's an Arthur Miller piece that we're shooting in Slovakia, which is on the border of the Ukraine know, and Kiev and everything. Anyway, um, and I broke eight ribs filming and um, Shit. yeah, um, got I was getting beaten up by the Nazis. I was doing my own stunts, which is weird because I'm Jewish. Um, and I don't know why that joke works, but it, it does. does. It does work. <laughs> Believe me, it works now. Um, and and I landed on my fist and broke eight ribs and we're, we're going to go back and, and, and finish our, our dream project, which, which I can't wait. And my character, you know, it's the lead, but he doesn't, he's not this effusive character. He's this tap dancer, Jewish tap dancer in 1937. Anyway, I, I love, you know, playing a character that's a verbal stunt pilot, like, Ari Gold was was an incredible gift, but I also love being in scenes and and uh, you know and being present and available and contributing and not having these the you know all you know take up all the oxygen with the dialogue. Do you tap dance? You know what i i've been I've been tapping for six years to okay. prepare. Um, Awesome. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's initially was humiliating. Um, and it went from, because I tap everywhere. Kyle knows he's sick of it. Um, but in in elevators, I would just, uh, I'm always tapping. And it started with people going, are, are, you, are you all right? What's going on? <laughs> like they thought I had an affliction. Like, or, or can you please, well, I don't know what that is. Can you stop that? It went from that to, oh, you tap. And then I was like, oh, shit. That was just little things like that. Like, okay, I think I'm onto something. I've been a drummer since I was a kid. I never would have even attempted 
to tap if I didn't have a sense of rhythm. And the way that I learned all the choreography was as a drummer, I would just, I could count it out, eight, mm. eight, four, four, two, two, whatever. And then, and then that was my, my way in. But to dance and then play drums with your feet is the, one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. I have such respect for those guys. Yeah. It's crazy. Here we go. Number two? Yeah. <laughs> Longest answer ever. Hey, brother, what's going on? Uh, I've been pursuing acting and screenwriting and directing for almost 20 years now. Um, you guys have both had outstanding careers, and I just wanted to know, at some point in your career, was there ever a time where you felt like giving up? And then at what point in your careers did you realize that you made it and that you're glad you didn't? Anyway, love you guys. I'm going to let you go first. Well, the first thing I'll say is that half seriously, half kidding for the, the beginning of my sort of struggle to have a career, I would say to everyone that would listen that I'd given myself a deadline to make it. And my deadline was if I hadn't made it by the time I got to my 80s, I'd give up <laughs> because I'm Asian. So I was yeah. like, I have to give myself a shot at those mystical, wise, old, you know, white beard. I am going to tell you the way of the world. Like if I hadn't made, if I didn't get those parts when I was 80, then, then I would know it's not going to happen for me. <laughs> That's <laughs> half kidding, half serious. And so I struggled a long time before I got Entourage. Entourage put me on the map. Yeah. So were there moments that I was down in those years? Of course, but I didn't ever seriously consider giving up. That's great. And that's, I love that because actors are actors for, their, for our whole lives. We're, we're very lucky, you know, in that way, because we can, if you want to, you can still get better. Yeah. Which, which is kind of fun and great. And, you know, listen, athletes have a finite amount of time, man. You know, they're in their mid thirties and they're all calling them old. It's just the weirdest mm -hmm. thing ever. You know, LeBron's 37. They're calling him ancient. Um, let's see. For me, yeah, I. it's a great question. And um, it's funny. I said this today. I said how delusional I am. And I think it's a very good quality for an actor to have. Um, I think it's a combination of knowing your limitations and being total, totally delusional at the same time. Um, yeah, what are you delusional about? I'm delusional in the way that I just, I, I think that I really do believe anything's possible and that, you know, I, I could read something and think, oh yeah, I could play that, I could do that, I could do that, I could do this. You know, I always think that, I guess because growing up on the stage and you'd play so many different characters and I was playing a character that they thought was my father when I was in my 20s and he, I wore a fat pad and it was just madness and was fun and Commedia dell'arte, white face and prosthetics. And um, I was playing Methuselah. I was playing the oldest man ever, 800 years old. Um, and so I guess because I've uh, jumped in and done all these, you know, ridiculous characters, um, there is a feeling that I'll, that I can and will try anything. Um, and then like you have that feeling that it's never too late. You know, I just did a, uh, I just did a movie with my mother and, um, she's going to kill me for saying this, but my mother at 90 years old, you know, played my mother in a movie and she was running lines with me. I've never s spoken my mother's age. Um, she didn't tell me how old she was until recently. She was very, we're a very, very vain family. Uh, my mom always runs lines with me. So my mother was doing your lines, drama, turtle, E, doing everyone's lines. Everything I've ever said is already going to send to my mom's face. And, you know, at 90 years old, I mean, you, you are absolutely never too old. As an actor, that's what's great. It yeah. just, it just doesn't matter. We can be as delusional as possible. That is the longest goddamn answer. <laughs> well, it world. wasn't even really an answer. To be <laughs> I forgot what the question was. The question is, was there ever a time when I thought about giving up? And the answer is no. I never thought about giving up because I'm delusional. And I think like there's always going to be something for me. You know, I'll play the bongos on the Third Street Promenade. and Don't go anywhere. How you live in J-Piv and we'll be right back after we pay some bills. 
so you know what's really interesting um I, I smoke cigars all the time and and everyone if they're in a picture or whatever someone says hey man where'd you get those and uh you know i tell them and you know what my favorite cigars are and then i just thought you know what i because i'm very particular about my cigars what is the best way to find a cigar that is really right for me that i love that has everything that i want i really i i want to i want an easy draw there's some cigars and i won't name any names cohiba um that are rolled they're the best in the world but they're rolled really tightly and it's it's hard to pull off them and so i want like a really easy draw i want that rich layered flavor listen i went to the the good people at illusione dion over there is the man he's a master blender and um he worked with me and he's patient and I'm a little bitch. I kept saying, listen, man, I want, you know what I mean? A little more of the coffee flavor. You know what I'm saying? Can we get some layers here an easier draw, whatever? And here we are, the J-Piv Robusto. I, I, I've, I never thought it would happen. I'm living the dream. Listen, LuxuryCigarClub.com is where you can order them. Uh, Illusioni makes them. They make them for me. It was a collaboration. I'm going to smoke one right now. If you guys send your review of the JPIV Robusto, I will send you a free stick and we shall raise one up together. I, I It's the least I can do. You guys send me a review and let me know what you guys think. I really want to know. And the great thing about the internet is they're brutal. So I'm going to get it. You know, hey, be careful what you wish for. I look forward to it. I, I believe in these. J. Piver Busto. Thanks, you guys. Did you guys know that EPC Champagne is rated in the top 1% of wines in the world on Vivino, the Vivino app, okay? Comparatively, let me give you a little perspective. The rest of the French Champagnes with similar ratings are listed for hundreds of dollars compared to EPC, which costs merely a fraction of that amount. You can do the math on that. Great Champagne, for a fraction of the cost, count me in. Here's something else I think is really cool. EPC offers customized bottle etchings so you can put on your own logo. I'm gonna put a little JPIV on there or how you live in JPIV. I'm gonna wake up, I'm gonna start drinking. That's another problem that we don't have enough time for right now. Here's the deal. <laughs> Just imagine how cool you could feel popping your own personalized bottle this summer at the pool, your beach party with your friends, your birthday party, whatever. Giving that special little someone the perfect gift on the perfect day, just a little day drinking, I'll see you there. EPC will be available in the U.S. for the first time ever, you guys. But the U.S. pre-launch, EPC offers you to discover its wines before anyone else. Just follow EPC Champagne on Instagram and you could win their full range of champagnes and their brand new rosé. Just follow EPC Champagne and you could be the proud owner of these prestigious wines before anyone else. How cool is that? You can't lose. All you guys have to do, follow EPC Champagne on Instagram to enter. Let's get after it. You bet, you, you, you bet. Uh, my wife and I watch her show. We love Ari. One of the questions that we had to ask you was, you say a lot of sexual things. If Ari wasn't a rep for Hollywood, would he be a porn star? What would be his name? And what would be his special move? Uh, God, that's a very awkward question, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Star, um, name, well, move. Yeah, yeah. I have a stand-up bit where I talk about, unfortunately, when Botox goes wrong and there's too much Botox and you kind of look like a baby seal emerging from the water in a wind tunnel and mm -hmm. everything's kind of pulled back and you look like a snake when it's molting and you, you've got the dewy underbelly, you know, when their faces are kind of very kind of smushed and pulled back and I just walk out to be. There's that moment and I remember saying dewy underbelly and I said, that would be a great name for a stripper. Dewey, oh, yeah. welcome to the stage. Dewey, underbelly. Um, I don't know. Sorry, I I go, I go, I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> I think the, pay, the peyote just kicked in and it's adorable. Um, I think, no, I don't, listen, Ari, he, I guess, yes, he did make, I mean, it was anal night at the gold house. I mean, he said these crazy things at all times and, had a lot of energy. And as your friend said in a very <laughs> awkward moment, if I say it, it'll sound weird. If you say it, it'll sound cute. Why they said, 
I had to- they, yes, they said they said they really wanted to know what it would be like to fuck Jeremy Piven because you have such an amazing energy. They wanted to know what would it be like to get fucked by that. Why did I ask you to say that? Because <laughs> you had the impulse to say it yourself, and then you like yeah. got scared to say it. So yeah. you said, say it for me, Rex, which I will gladly do. Oh, my God. So um, we have so many sound bites for season two. It's unbelievable. I have to interrupt you for one second because uh -oh. I did just now have a thought of why, if I was in porn, there's something that like would be a selling point for me being in porn. But then I decided... Yeah, you can't say that to these people, so I won't. Even though I've done the whole, I have a secret, and now I'm not going to tell you. I know that's infuriating. I'm, I apologize. I'm going to go down a road with you for your poor name, which will be wrong, okay, and then sure. you write the ship. Is it something like Raging Dragon? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Is that too much? Am I, Raging if I could, Dragon. Do you know what I mean? Um, Crouching tiger, raging mm. dragon. I don't know. Is there a crouching tiger in in Lloyd's? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's probably more like dragon on fire. I think, I mean, I'm not going to go too in depth about my sexual life. Oh. But I do think that people think I have a lot of enthusiasm. I, okay. I love sex. Like, I'm a Capricorn. And I take sex very seriously. Oh. I mean, in a, in a good way. Okay. Meaning... When I'm in a sexual situation with someone, part of my intention is you're going to feel so good. I'm going to make you feel good. Like it's all about your pleasure is going to, you know, you've never known such pleasure. Like that's part of like what I bring to it. You're, you're going to get a lot of attention after this, by the way, because <laughs> who, you know, people just want to feel good. They do. But you're going to get some very interesting DMs after this, by the way. You know what I'm saying? That was the whole plan. Yeah, this is it. That was the whole plan. Mission accomplished. The great thing about DMs is you can totally ignore them. And and you and I are basically at a point in our lives where if someone DMs us and you just don't respond, they just assume you never saw it. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. This one is an impression that I thought was... <laughs> I, I wanted your comments on. Yeah. Right? I'm already apprehensive. <laughs> I regret ever having met you, Ari Gold. Your car is on Wilshire and Crescent waiting for you. I'm abandoning it, yes. And I'm abandoning you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the end got me. That's why. That's I, amazing. Yeah. The I mean, interesting thing is at the beginning of that, it sounded a little bit like me. Yeah. That's hilarious. Like that intersection, Wilshire and Crescent, is very close to my manager's office. And so on the day we were shooting that, I'm like, I don't know where you are, but you might want to look out your window because from where you're sitting, like where his office was at the time, I'm like, I think if you like crane your neck, you can see us. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the the car they gave you, everything was totally unexpected. Like, oh no, who, I was driving your car in that scene. I but I'm saying ultimately oh, yeah, 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 when yeah, yeah. we revealed Lloyd's car. Oh yeah, no, that was hilarious. <laughs> you just. Yeah, you just didn't I see mean, the I mean, when I saw that car, I literally was like, what's that for? <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, that's your car. Yeah. And I stared at the car and I wrapped my mind around the idea. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. You just I never heard the term rice rocket. I was like, what's a rice rocket? I don't know. Maybe that's your porn name. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> We've got a winner. Welcome to the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, put it together. Put your tater tots down. Rice rocket. <laughs> what was your sweaty underbelly? Dewey. Dewey. Dewey, Dewey underbelly. Sweaty underbelly. Sweaty. I don't think sweaty underbelly is going to work too much. Dewey. Dewey, because Dewey's could be, yeah, anyway. yeah. So wait, you are or are not very hairy under, the, under there? Um, we're entering an interesting part of the <laughs> podcast. Um, I come from a long line of Eastern European Jewish yeah. uh, hairy uh, men mm. um, who are also follically challenged. And it's God's little trick. Um, what if I just started crying like a grandmother <laughs> right now in the middle of this podcast? Uh, I am. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm pretty hairy, but I'm very vain. So oh, I, get it. I manscape. Yeah, you didn't, have, you didn't have to tell me that. By the way, this podcast is brought to you by Manscaped. 
Use the Lawn Trimmer 4.0 for those hard places. For your power <laughs> soles, I use- You really use it. You know all the terminology. I do all the, Okay. And they do sponsor us and they're, the, I use it. I'm not just okay. saying it. I use the product. It is kind of amazing. Good night, everyone. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Next question. Someone is trying to pitch a reboot. All right. <laughs> we love it. Rex's idea was excellent. A show about agents with different clients that they solve problems for every week. But a side story for that would be having Ari's daughter as an agent, having Jonah, Ari's son, starting off in the mailroom, and then by the end of the series, him being a full-blown agent as well. Can we go back, and, and what was your idea again? Okay, by the way, I, a lot of people have pointed out that my idea has actually been done. There's a French series oh. called Deep Pour Slam. Yeah, and call your agent. Call, call, call my agent. Call my agent. But way before that show ever existed, I was at an HBO party and I ran into Sue Nagel, who was head of HBO at the time. And I was a little drunk and my breath probably wasn't great. And I was like, so here's what you do. When Entourage is over, you create a show called Agency. And it's basically Ari and Lloyd at the agency. And every week there are new guest stars. Our client this week is Toby Maguire and mm. um, Ariana Grande. And then our clients next week are... are, are uh, DiCaprio. Exactly. And so at the time I pitched it like the love boat. Right. We're, we're, we're Julie McCoy, cruise director and Captain Steubing. Yeah. And every week there are all these people that come on our boat and, and we, we fix their lives. So that was my idea. And Sue Nagel just was like, Please get away from me. <laughs> um, well, you know, I, I think that, first of all, one of the many reasons I think the show worked is that people love, it, it, it's, a, it's a world people are fascinated by. You know, they don't get to see it, the backstage life of, of Hollywood and how that inner workings work and, you know, how it goes down. And so I think that's a, it's a great idea. And so he's saying, what, a, what about my kids, that they're agents? I think that would be, fascinating to see because it would raise the stakes even yeah. higher for Ari. These are his kids that are, and he, you know, you learn a lot about yourself whenever you teach, you know, and you have to, or direct or whatever. And so he would learn a lot about himself, you know, through helping his kids become agents. And so that could be really fascinating. Yeah, I like that idea. Yeah. What would be funny is if your daughter had you like she took more from you than mom and she was the loud abrasive mm. you know inappropriate one and then you get to see it from a third perspective and you're like you need to stop you can't say that and you become the pc police i mean talk about a misdirect that would be insane <laughs> um but also uh a, an incredible organic way for him to see the way he really is and uh yeah, because it's hard for us to see ourselves. And for him to see himself and his daughter and she's taken on these traits, that would be kind of amazing. Um, that's a great idea. Why not? Why not do it? I love it. I mean, I remember in, in terms of a of a of a a breakthrough moment for Entourage for for me and for Ari and how I I won my first Emmy was when I found out that I was the reason why my son wasn't going to get an education because the headmaster basically breaks it. Dan Castellaneta, who played it so brilliantly, who's the voice of Homer Simpson, basically another Chicago guy. We we both come from Second City, and, and he was genius. And he basically, I went to him to try to get my son in, and I apologized, and, and uh, I, you know, I was just trying to get any different way to get my son, you know, to continue with the school and he said listen and i thought is it because my son doesn't he doesn't do well but he's going to do better and they basically said listen he's not going to continue at this school because of you because you're too abrasive and we can't have you around the school and then ari realizes because of his behavior he's going to get in the way of his son's education and gets really emotional and it was the first time we've seen that from ari and um I remember Doug saying that he didn't think we need needed the emotion there. Oh. 
And uh, so we took it out. And I remember seeing, and, and I and I somehow intrinsically knew when I said, can I see a cut? Which he never lets me see, and he was nice enough to let me see the cut. And they took the emotionality out, and I said, I think it really works, though, because it means a lot to him. And he said, yeah, it's just a private school. What's the big deal? And I said to Doug, if you got in the way of your kid's education, would you get emotional? And he said, yeah. And then I just left it with him, and I, I turned that episode in to the Academy and won my first Emmy. Um, and now I have three, but who's counting me? <laughs> <laughs> I knew the number. <laughs> Just kidding. That's ridiculous. All right. This is the last one we have. Last and, one. Uh, it's, it's, it's a, a request. Mr. Pillard, you are like one of our big heroes. My son literally loves you. We've watched Entourage like about eight times. It's, anyway, it's his 21st birthday in a few weeks time. And I'm just listening to some of your podcasts and it mentioned you might be able to do something. If you could record a birthday message, his name's Max Aston. If you can do it as Ari Gold, because that's like his absolute favorite person in the whole world. He loves it. Just calling him something revolting and being really horrible to him. Um, but, you know, at the end saying happy 21st birthday, your little mensch or something. You know, we're of the same. We're, we're also uh, we're in the same Jew. We're, we're Jews too. Um, so he loves anything Jewish related. It'd be funny. But if so you don't here's, mind, here's what's like, interesting about that is that that peop people think that you know, I'm just going to randomly, you know, wish them happy birthday. And I, and I'm not, this isn't, the reality is I'm, I'm on, I don't know if you're on Cameo. I am. Okay. So Cameo is something that, you know, we, you know, we can make videos for anyone and it's really, I actually have a really good time. It's really fun. And, and I have no idea what I'm doing. And, um, but for this fucking lunatic to think <laughs> that I'm going to wish fucking Max a happy 21st fucking birthday. Max is viciously mediocre. I happen to know for a fucking fact that Max has no business, no business whatsoever, even being 21 years fucking old. Okay, Max? So why don't you pull your head out of your fucking ass and realize that the world is yours and I fucking love you with the power of Christ, even though I'm Jewish. Yeah. There we go. That's for you, brother. Free. Thank you. <laughs> Look at Rex. Rex will never, ever break. He will never. <laughs> well, I mean. As soon as I locked Max into it, he just he fucking like goes right back gold. in. No, that's awesome. No, when people, I do, I do get people um, reaching out to me, and I'm sure you do too. And I, I direct them to Cameo, and I, this sounds like I'm doing an ad for Cameo, and I'm not. But this episode is brought to you by Cameo. Is that, I think that's it. I think that's when you when you hit the when you're done when you're re getting us to to do videos for people. <laughs> you were very nice to do that. I mean, oh, I, are you I, kidding? It, that was misdirect. I was no. like, is he about to direct them a cameo? I wouldn't. That would, that no, that would I, be acceptable. <laughs> no, it, it, it's awesome. And like, you know, the feedback that you get, it's just really cool. It's funny. I told my mom about about this, and she was just like really serious, and she's like, "You better." really take the time and do these right and i was like no and it's just you know she's like you gotta and so i try to i try to do them but it is a little awkward because the reality is a lot of times people just want me to yell at them mm. and so for me just to just randomly be yelling at people and like swearing and telling them that they're a piece of shit and then sending it to the universe i just feel like it can get into the wrong hands yeah and then suddenly in the wrong context look like I, you know, have gone full Kanye. What? Uh-oh. No, sorry. I'm actually surprised because you've done quite a few of those cameos. I've never seen one, as you say, in the wild. I've never seen it on YouTube or anyone posting it anywhere. I tell you, it's, it, it, I, 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 it's a fine line where I, I understand that they want me to berate them, which I don't understand, which is odd to me. But, but at the same time, I, I have to say, look at your kids have reached out to me. You've got a beautiful family. I just want to celebrate you, man. You're you're doing great. And ultimately, um, so I, I do get it all out. And then I just tell them just from what I can see that I think, because it's hard for me just to, you know, call people a piece of shit and then just hang up on them. <laughs> you know, it just, it feels awkward. Rex, you said that you do cameo as well. What what are the most asked questions or requests from you? Is it birthdays or voicemails or a lot of birthdays? Um, yeah, a lot of birthdays. 
don't know. Do you- a lot, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe it's because of the whole Ari Gold, like, sorry, Ari Gold and Lloyd having like this work relationship. But I do occasionally get asked to like address the employees of a company and give them a pep talk occasionally. That's, I mean, that's kind of cool. And, and as, as actors, we feel ill-equipped to give anyone a pep talk. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but we do it. Well, thank you for doing this again, man. That was been fun. And I had fun. it doesn't feel like it's it felt like two minutes. Yeah, it didn't feel like very long at all, which was nice. <laughs> yeah. Because <this laughs> as great. I said, I was just scared. I'm like, oh, do I have anything to say? You have a lot to say. <laughs> this was this was great, man. You have you have I you know, we want to have you keep coming back um until you're sick of us. <laughs> okay. We love it. And well, I, and people love hearing from you and and um we can't ever take for granted. The fact that we we have a connection with people. Yeah. Let's keep it going, goddammit. <laughs> How You Live in Jay Piven is a cast original podcast in association with Common Enemy. Producer is Kyle Tequila. Theme song by Common. To leave a message for Jeremy, go to speakpipe.com slash jpiven. Catch all new episodes of How You Live in Jay Piven every Wednesday on YouTube and everywhere you get your podcasts.